everyone, I'm Gemma Starr and welcome to another episode of Heart Warriors. This is a series I've been inspired and guided to do thanks to my energetic connection with Katajuda, which is the sacred masculine site in Central Australia, very close to Uluru, which is the sacred feminine site. What I'm here to do is to give a platform to our men so they can share their journey into the heart with other men uh, man to man, and they can share the specifics of uh, the masculine journey, uh, their challenges, their insights, their tools, their practices, and of course, for us women to get a better understanding of um, their journey. Today's guest is Greg Prescott. He's over there in the States and he is a a uh, writer and um, into 5D energies, metaphysics, spirituality, uh, divine union, and um, all those juicy things. So um, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome Greg to the show and enjoy. Hello, Greg Prescott. Welcome to Heart Warriors. Hi, How are you today? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Where about in the States are you? I live in Florida um, on a, near a, a, a beach called Siesta Key where the sand is 99.9% .9 quartz crystal. I think it's kind of like, I think it's the remnants of Atlantis. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Greg, can we start off by telling um, our audience who is the man you are today? Who is Greg Prescott today? <laughs> Coming out swinging, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, the man I am today isn't the man I was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, growing up. You know, growing up, I was your you know, typical dude, I guess you'd say, here in the United States. Um, you know, I played all the sports you threw in front of me. I also played lead and rhythm guitar in several hard rock bands in my 20s. And I still play guitar to this day, but things kind of changed for me in several areas. Actually, initially, when my parents brought me to Sunday school, I would get the EBGBs when I walked into church. And I didn't know why. And then I almost got kicked out of Sunday school for asking my Sunday school teacher way too many questions. Because it didn't make sense. I wasn't agreeing with what they were saying. And here I am, like four years old, they're threatening to kick me out of Sunday school class. But then, you know, fast forward, you know, I, I played all in, you know, all these bands in my 20s and stuff. And then uh, I met my daughter's mother. And uh, that the birth of my daughter. My daughter was conceived on my 33rd birthday. As you know, 33 is a master number. And my daughter had a contract with me, basically saying, if I'm not on my path by the time I turn 33, I'm coming in and I'm gonna get you there. So my daughter, Brittany, has been a huge blessing for me. The marriage with her mom didn't work out, but I had joint custody and one day I was over at her mom's house picking her up. I had her Mondays, Wednesdays, and every other weekend. Her mom had her Tuesdays, Thursdays, and every other weekend. Whoever had her on the weekend got her on Friday. So I was over there on a Friday to pick her up. And Britt wasn't ready at the time. So her mom was like, have you ever seen the trailer to The Secret? And this is back in, I think, 2006, 2007, somewhere in that area. I go, no. So I went inside and I watched that trailer and I was so blown away that by the time Britt and I got back to my house, I ordered it yeah. and my life changed from that point forward. Uh, yeah. I used to be heavily, as I mentioned, into sports and I have a photographic memory when it comes to statistics in sports. For example, I could tell you who's third in the National League in baseball here in the United States in doubles and how many they had or what their ERA is or whatever. And for some reason, I would just see it and it just got stuck in my mind. And it was a lot of crap that was getting cluttering my mind. But flash forward to that watching The Secret. After I watched it, I stopped watching 
all sports except for American football. That's the only one I watch and follow. Everything else I dropped because it was cluttering my mind. So, wow. yeah. but we, we, go oh, go ahead. Go on. Okay. I was just going to jump back to your childhood. Um, what would you say was the most challenging point of your childhood? I guess uh, one of the lessons I learned, and it's not a good lesson to learn, but I did something when I was younger. I was not an angel. I was, you know, the black sheep of the family. That's me. <laughs> I was a rebel. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was your typical, I guess, you know, bad boy, you know, so to speak. And uh, whatever I did, my dad got his strap out. And he's about to hit me with it. And as he's coming down, I kind of escaped from him, but his strap caught me diagonally across my back. I went to school that day and I had gym class. I think it was like fourth period or third period. Anyway, I went to the bathroom, the men's room before class and I lifted my shirt up and I still had that mark welt going across my back. It was that day that I swore that if I ever had children, I'll never spank them or hit them. And my daughter can attest to that, but that was like a very poignant part because in psychology, Albert Bandura has proposed this theory of modeling, basically, which says that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So if you're hitting your child, chances, if you're being hit by your parent, chances are you're going to hit your child. But that's also an opportunity to break the cycle, too. And the hardest part is to look at it as a third person and realize that, you know what? I was the one that was hitting my parents in previous lifetimes that's hard to swallow a lot of people don't want to see that especially when it comes to very touchy issues such as child abuse the abuser was the child and, the, and vice versa you know, yeah. in previous lifetimes so you know to look at it from that third person and to say you know what it's over the cycle's done i'm so sorry that i abused you in previous lifetimes i forgive you for abusing me in this lifetime and it's over with so yeah that would be it. Greg, that was such a pivotal part of my own experience as well, understanding the concept of reincarnation and soul agreements and, you know, um, and how all these connections are, are pre-planned. Um, for anyone yeah. who maybe doesn't understand the the concept of, of reincarnation and how we, how we make uh, soul agreements, would you like to speak about that? <laughs> yeah soul contracts are something matter of fact on the other side of the veil we wouldn't have met unless we already had a soul contract we had met on the other side of the veil this is what i do i bring star family together but you know what we were brought together a long long time ago before both of us were even born and you make thousands hundreds probably tens of thousands of soul agreements with various people, including somebody you might only see one time, a cashier at a grocery store. I, and you never know, the person that lets you in when you're driving and it's a busy day in traffic and you're trying to get out into the, that person, you've got soul contracts with so many people. I had a dream though, one time, Gemma, this is pretty fun. Um, I was on the other side of the veil and, and it's foggy and people are walking around like dazed and confused, you know? And, blank looks on their faces kind of thing. And I realized all their minds were wiped and they were getting ready to incarnate. And so it was my turn to come, come down. And I, I was playing stupid because I still had all my memories and this elder was bringing me in and they, what they did to, in the metaphor, they, they showed it as an elevator, the incarnation process, you know, through metaphor in my dreams. So they're asking me all these questions on the, on, as I'm incarnating, incarnating as i'm coming down and uh right toward the end they caught me and i slipped up on one of my answers and they sent me back up and they wiped my mind but obviously not completely if i remember that wow. so there's still memories from that but yeah we all go through this incarnation process we have soul contracts that we made we try to make up and atone for previous life mistakes like my previous life mistake of 
apparently spanking my parents, <laughs> you know? So yeah, we go through all that and here we are right now. Like I said, you and I were supposed to do this because it's part of our soul contract. Yeah, love it, love it. Thank you for that explanation. Um, was Did that make it easier to forgive your father? Because I can't, was oh, yeah. that the only incidents of, of uh, violence or were there others? Yeah. Uh, no, my, my father is just, you know, he's a type B personality, laid back, easy going. That's the way I am. You know, I don't I don't like fretting over anything. I don't like arguments. Uh, my dad's easy going. My mom was the one that made him do that. So my mom's type A personality, controlling. She's like, you go have to, you have to spank your son for that. Get the strap. I, he didn't want to do it. I can't blame him. Did you describe in a couple of words the relationship with your mom? Like I said, she's a type A controlling personality, but I realized that she pushes me a lot. And it's not because, you know, she hates me. It's because she wants the best for me. Yeah. You know, and that's her way of showing love. But I, I will tell you, though, and my sisters will agree on this. We never heard, I love you. We knew that our parents loved us, but they never verbally said that. And after my daughter was born, she'll tell you that I said it at least 10, 20 times a day, constantly telling her I love her. So I didn't want that mistake to happen. And once again, maybe that was me in a previous lifetime with them. Maybe after I was hitting them, you know, I was the one hitting them with a strap and never saying I love you. Maybe that, that was the, the you know whole karmic wheel coming to a full circle. But now we say I love you. Every, always, yeah, every day, every time we see each other. Wow. There's a lot of men who have grown up in a similar um, childhood. What do you say to those men that are maybe still a bit stuck and with, you know, being able to forgive their parents? Have you got any other insights or tools or practices that you can offer men that are starting that that to unravel that wound? You know, oftentimes, I've mentioned so many times on my own podcasts on in 5D, oftentimes people will pretend to be what society expects them to be and will go to their graves never knowing who they truly were. And to those men, I would say, open up to who you are and don't be ashamed or afraid of saying, this is me, you know, like me, love me accept and own who you are don't be afraid don't put, don't try to project somebody that you're not just be you it's that that simple yeah just a, a mind shift yeah yeah <laughs> hi greg can we jump ahead to what would you say was your deepest darkest moment as an adult hmm. probably my gosh, it's been a few of them. I think a lot of people, once you think you've gone through the dark night, the soul universe says, no, you haven't. <laughs> you well, whichever one, whichever one comes up, let's dig into that. Well, uh, I was married twice before my current wife, Allie. Um, and divorce number two, after that, you know, I, I started dating a while, you know, maybe four or five months after that divorce. It was probably a little longer than that, but um, that didn't last long. And then my dog died and it just seemed like everything came down on me. And that was, that was pretty rough. But, you know, about a year and a half ago, I got diverticulitis and I ended up having a colostomy and then a reverse colostomy and an incisional hernia and an incidental appendectomy all done at once on me. And then I had a, this past December, I had a quadruple bypass. So, I mean, but here I am, you know, I'm still wow. here. You look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. And Go yeah, I did, I did follow your journey as you were going through it. What did that feel like to be in that hospital bed and just with all these physical things happening? Like, First of all, what did it feel like? Because, you know, you're used to being at 
active and out and about on the beach and guitar and um and yeah let's start with that what did that feel like well initially there's a lot of pressure congestion in my chest and uh i'm like so this isn't good i drove myself to the hospital and got there and they're like hey you <laughs> probably shouldn't have drove here <laughs> but i made it and uh uh, they say we gotta we gotta get you in ASAP. Um, I had a heart attack a couple of years ago, and they put a stent in my heart. So th this second time around on this, um, and I'm you know I turned 62 in October. I'm thinking, damn, I'm too young to be dying yet. But uh, so yeah, they they brought me in the following day. I had a quadruple bypass, and it was, in, it was what was interesting about that. Actually, no, it was two days later. Because the following day, the doctor came into the room, the, the surgeon, he goes, sorry, I got, I know I got to wash my mouth on this. Have you been jabbed yet? And uh, I go, nope. He goes, well, I don't operate on people that haven't been jabbed. I said, well, that's the way it is. Following day, he comes back and he goes, oh, I'll operate on you. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I had it done. And I mean, honestly, you can't even see where they carved into me. You know, they're, they're, before they had these huge butterfly stitches that they put in. Now it's just a very tiny seam and can't even tell, honestly. So what was so. your mental process as you were? You were there, obviously. Uh, how long were you in hospital for? A couple of weeks, probably. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I can even... I can only imagine as a man that puts you in a, a place of maybe not being in control, of maybe uh, vulnerability, weakness. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you, how did you feel? I can only imagine. Um, what was your mental process to start spiralling up instead of giving up and spiralling down? <laughs> well, I got to tell you this. They, they had me, they wanted to give me pre, uh, diabetes medication because I was, you know, pre-diabetic, according to them. Um, my, my blood, I take my blood sugar every day and I know that it's anywhere between, you know, like 95 and maybe 110. Um, but they wanted to give me some, and I'm like, no, I give me something to sign. I will not take this crap because that's what they push. On you they're trying to get people you know signed up for this lifelong medication you know it, calling me pre-diabetic i'm like no no not happening so it's i think that was the rebel rebellious side of me uh rebelling mm -hmm. to the controlling person like my mom was yeah. i i would rebel against the doctors as well you know the doctor tried to bully me into getting the shot and i said no and they tried to bully me into taking some medication i knew that i didn't need lifelong medication no yeah. so the spiraling up though part you know go, coming from that point going up it's all in your belief system honestly you know you look at it as a you know third person as an outsider looking in uh, I, I tend to do that you know through introspect and to think how grateful i am to have the support there were times I remember on one of my, um, I, d I did a live show. I'm not sure if it was a spirit chat or a live show or whatever I, I, I did, but so many people were sending me loving, healing energy. And I'm, I'm telling you and everybody that's listening right now, whoever's receiving it feels it. They feel it. it I felt it to the point of tears in my eyes, crying, that it was so powerful. So many people were sending me so much love and so much healing energy. The love, care, and compassion from our whole N5D family and their support for me was just overwhelming. And uh, that alone, I mean, knowing that you have that kind of support and so many people that love you and want, want you to get healthy, you know, that's, you have everything to live for. You know, I've got a beautiful wife, gorgeous daughter, great family, you know, so and I'll tell you what, Gemma, if I've faced death enough times, that was the number one thing when I was growing up that I was afraid of was death. But I faced it so many times. I'm like, that's the best you got. Come on. 
bring it on. <laughs> it's there's nothing to fear. You know, whenever that time is comes that, you know, it's time for me to expire. So be it. I'm, I'm ready for it. It'll happen. I'll be okay with it. What was the closest you say that you came to death? Well, I guess <clears throat> either heart attack could have done it. Um, <clears throat> got into a car accident one time. Some guy ran a stop sign and I plowed into him doing 70 miles an hour. Um, let's see. Sorry, a few times. <laughs> okay, take your yeah, pick. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we've all had some kind of fate with death at some point in our lives. But it's, interestingly, my father, about a week before that accident, he retired and he gave me his company car. And it was a Chevy Lumina. And at the time, I was driving this old Nissan Sentra. That At the time, I was living in upstate New York. And uh, all the cars up there get rusted out from the sanders and snow and winter and all that. So I, it was rusted so badly, I could see through my floorboard. Uh, I could see the, the pavement through my floorboard. But about a week before that accident, my dad gave me his car. And of course, the car went a week and then I got it into an accident. But I, and I've told my dad this several times, he saved my life. With that Nissan, I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, and once again, you know, we make all these soul contracts on the other side of the veil. And that was one that my father made with me saying, at some point, I got your back. You know, you, you got to be here for greater purposes. And I, I'm going to make sure that you, you are uh, going to be here for that. So Love it. Love it. Um, let's go back to, if we can, Greg, to the secret, because I also, you know, uh, was very into that when it came out for people who don't know what that is. Can you give an overview, please? No, it's a secret. Because <laughs> it was massive when it came out. I mean, I will yeah. say they did leave out a critical part, but we can discuss that later. But for people who are new to the secret, what is it? It really is everything. Um, it's it's one of the the secret is one of the universal laws. It's the law of attraction. What you put out comes back. Um, I like using it for finding parking spaces at the beach. Cause I go to this one little beach on Siesta Key and there's only parking for 20 cars there. But I imagine before I even pull in, the first three spots are open. And I, I have my choice of one of those and it's worked so many times. And I've taken so many pictures of my car, different days, you know, number one spot, the best spot on the beach. It, it could be the, you know, a busy day on Saturday, you know, and noon and somebody's pulling out when i when i'm pulling in it's just unbelievable so yeah what you put out there comes back a lot of it has to do with you know your thoughts and emotions the emotions are key and you know putting that emotion in into it envisioning this is how i'm going to feel when that spot is open I'm like yes thank you universe you know and i always say that when whenever i put something out there and it comes true thank you universe so yeah, yeah, I'm I'm exactly the same. Um, so just for maybe just to um add on to that, the secret was a book that came out when in the nineties. Did you say was it the nineties? No, oh, the book might have. I don't know. I saw the video in like two thousand six. Oh, early two thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out where I was. I was yeah, yeah. So it was. It was early two thousands, and then a, a movie came out later. So that yeah. was the secret, and it was massive. And you know. For those of us that were already sort of, you know, on the on the journey, it was um, a big key. But I don't believe that uh, they put the emotional aspect into that. I think they were doing it all with the mind games. They left out this key of emotional um, frequency that we send out along with the with the with the thoughts. How do you yeah. how do you sit and create that emotion? So let's take a, a different example from the car space. Let's say, for example, you're lying in a hospital bed and you know you've had a heart attack. How do you start creating your new reality? 
I think a lot of that done is done just on a higher level. It's, for me, it's it's about vibration and maintaining a high vibration. As long, you know, as long as you maintain and keep that vibration up, no matter what happens to you, things will lift up to that vibration. That you're setting the bar. Basically, your vibration is the bar of attainment. Um, so you know, I'm up here, I have a heart attack operation, but this keeps me back up here. It brings me back to where I was. It's like stasis, kind of, so to speak, of leveling things out to where they are supposed to be. Yeah, it's. Uh, would you agree that it's all the work we've done beforehand that um, just naturally then bounces us back up? Like we know that. <laughs> what happened yesterday is creating our today. So what's happening today is creating our tomorrow. And so we have no fear of the future now because we know we're living in, in um, out of the, the heart energies today. Would you agree with that? Definitely. Definitely. There's, a, you know, there's so much work that we all have to do, period. And, you know, if you're just starting out, don't look at it as being overwhelming. The way I say it, you know, if somebody's just waking up right now, it's like going to a buffet and loading your plate up. You got this plate stacked up to here with food. But forkful by forkful, you end up cleaning your plate off, you know, and um, we're all in that boat with, with you. If you're, you know, because no one's, no one's ever going to be fully, you know, there's always more work to do, you know. Have you, have you ascended yet? No? Well, you got more work to do, <laughs> you know. So that's the way I see it, so. Do you incorporate any specific practices into your daily routine or weekly routine, um, you know, as you were cleaning yourself up and upping your vibe? Can you share that those with us, please? Yeah. Uh, when I go to the beach, I do what I call a walk of gratitude. And there's a seawall at the end of the beach that I always stop at. And that's my reminder to do my well my routine every day and uh and what i do is I, I i say dear creator source universe spirit guides guardian angels friends and family on both sides of the veil galactic neighbors and friends higher self and mother earth i'm sorry if i don't say this as much as i should please forgive me thank you for your unconditional love safety support protection and abundance in everything that's good in life as i promise to listen with open eyes ears mind and heart and lastly more than anything, I love you all. I ask that you help me turn on all the beneficial codons in my RNA and DNA so I can heal myself and others and humanity's best interests as well. And then what I do when I walk back, I, I do what I call love bubble meditation. I envision that there's this huge bubble of energy that's, that surrounds me. And anyone that comes in contact with me and my energy just automatically has their vibrations raised and they have no idea why. And once I could, my big thing, and I've been working on this for years, is uh, DNA. I've been working on my DNA ever since probably the mid 2000s, um, trying to figure out because Greg Braden mentioned that we only have 20 of the 64 codons in our DNA turned on. And whoever can figure out how to turn on the remaining 44 can do anything. So that's why, you know, I've, I've had, I've done conferences uh, and been a, you know, keynote speaker on how to you know, change your DNA right now. And uh, I'm wor I work on that every day. So, you know, that's one of my, my passions is uh, trying to figure out how to turn on all these beneficial codes in our DNA. Because if you can do that, you can do anything. You don't have any ability. I could see some person limping across the beach and just put my hand on his shoulder and say, are you having a, a good day today? But my hand on his shoulder would automatically heal him. And all of a sudden you'd be able to walk for, you know, without knowing why and, you know, or what I could do too, this is what I envision. I could heal the air, water, and food supply by just laying my hands on the earth. If I could open up all the codons in my DNA, just lay my hands on, on Mother Earth and heal all the air, water, and food supplies. Then I could hook my higher self up with every other higher self on the planet and automatically heal them too without anyone knowing it was me. That would be like the, the ultimate random act of kindness. Yeah. Greg, can you share with us um, the knowledge that you've come away with as you've, you've explored this DNA um, aspect? What what did you learn once you started delving into it? What were the specifics? 
Well, if you notice, one of the things I did when I did my walk of gratitude, I used Ho'oponopono. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I don't say this as often as I should. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Yeah. Um, I believe that our DNA is programmable. I think mm -hmm. that with enough affirmations and inner work and visions um, and, and, and that, that feeling, as we were mentioning about with the secret, the emotion that goes into that. I have a, a one hour uh, RNA DNA codon activation video. And it's on your 5 it's free. If you want, anyone wants to check it out. I have it with ambient music in the background and without the ambient music. And oftentimes when I go to the beach, before I do my walk of gratitude, I'll, I'll walk the beach for miles you know, at least an hour long to, and I'll listen to that video over and over and over again, um, programming my mind uh, that all of the beneficial codons in my DNA are now open. So, you know, I, I think, I think it's, it, it's working. I honestly, I'm, 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 I'm getting to that point where, you know, you look at, you look at people, I don't, I hate to ask you how old you are, and I'm not going to, but, you know, I, I turned 62 in October, and people, when I was, you know, 30, 40 years ago, when they were in their 60s, they looked it. People nowadays in their 50s, and they don't look their age anymore. Something's changing, and I think there is something going on with our DNA right now. What do you think? Definitely. Well, I'm 56, so, um, yeah, I, I don't... I don't think I look at in fact I stopped I even know. celebrating birthdays because it was just it was wasn't in resonance you know the the age they tell us we are is not the truth of who I am so you know because as all aspects of my life I'm you know living in alignment with my true self that just just didn't resonate anymore and so I say it but it's it's as if I'm telling a lie but you know <laughs> But I think we're all going to go back to 33 anyway as we go into 5D. And, of course, ageless and, and immortal. What do you reckon about that? Okay, well, first I have to ask you this. Do you dream? Well, I do, but I don't remember them. Very rarely remember them. Okay. I have this uh, rare sleep anomaly where as soon as I go to sleep, I instantly go into the dream stage and I stay there all night. The stage after is when they say you have all this beneficial healing and stuff. I, I don't get any. I had a, had sleep apnea and I, I had to have a sleep study done where they put all these electrodes all over your body. And that's how they, they found out about that. But when I, so I immediately go into the dream stage and I remember my dreams. Um, when I dream, and I'll put this out there to any of your viewers too that are, are watching. I don't see old people in my dreams. The oldest people I see might be my parents and they're in their thirties. Maybe my dad might be 40 or something like that. The only reason they appear that old is because if there were any younger, I wouldn't recognize them. Everybody is young in my dreams. My sister died in 2011. And when she visits me in my dreams, she looks like she's about 23 or so oh, young, healthy, beautiful, happy. You know, um, every, everybody's young. I don't see old people. And my no nobody's old in my dreams. And I think that's our our true spiritual reality. It, it, our dreams are more real than this physical existence. Because when we're on the other side of the veil, you're not looking at a watch. You don't know what time it is. There is no time on the other side. You know, and you, you can fly. And many many of us have had those dreams of being able to fly. I'm petrified of heights, but in my dreams when I can fly, it's so friggin' natural and fun. You know, I, I totally yeah. dig it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Often the dreams that I do remember are about flying. So I've always, so, you know, pondering on this the, the last maybe decade, you know, as I was coming into my 50s and really feeling out of alignment with, I, I really think that age is a, a program that um, they've put on us in some way. What do you think about that? Because, yeah, as you said, our natural state is ageless and immortal. I have an article that I wrote on in 5D. It's called Saturn, the Cult of L. 
And Saturn is known for being Kronos, Father Time, Saturn, Satan, uh, all the wonderful acronyms they come up with. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that, <laughs> we won't go there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Wearing his red. Indeed, Back on track. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it, it, it is a program, you know. If if you were to live on Mars, Mars has a shorter day, it's a smaller planet, you know, a shorter day than than Earth. You might be, you know, forty one on Mars, and I might be, you know, fifty two or something like that. It's just a number, it doesn't matter. Though I do believe in older times where our you know, we lived to be much older then we are right now definitely like you know two three four hundred years old um because i mean really if we weren't programmed to celebrate a birthday every year who, who would know i mean would it be important but you know let's get back on track now to men <laughs> um so i love that um that gratitude war and you know so much of your journey um is exactly the things i was doing in the you know 90s early two, 2000s and uh so i can really relate to all of it and um obviously it worked for me as well are there any other sort of practices that you started doing apart from you know the affirmations have you got any favorite affirmations so basically i, I from my experience with the affirmations i was reprogramming my mind did you go through a phase of actively being aware of um, your mental self-talk and switching it, reprogramming it? No. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> okay. So yeah, what did yeah. you do to, to have the, the positive state of mind? Meditated a lot. Um, when, yeah, for, for years I would meditate and, uh, you know, for hours. And uh, it, it really does a number. It brings you to a place where, you know, I now, now, I, right now, I there's probably other people I can do this out, and probably many people, but it's not going to happen immediately when you meditate. I can go to the beach. There could be thousands of people on the beach. And as soon as I get into that meditative state, I'm the only one there. I can't hear anything. None, nobody else around me exists when when I get into that meditative state. That takes time. So you, it's not going to happen. Maybe it can happen to the novice meditator. I don't know. It didn't happen to me. It took it took time. But once you get into that that zone, you can get into that zone anywhere at any time. Yes. I think, and it yeah, brings you, know. you to that spot once yeah. again. Yeah. So, a lot of men are very much in their mind, and they're just like, "I can't meditate. Tried it once. Can't do it." What advice have you got for those? How do you, how does one start? Can you give us some practical tips and steps for an absolute beginner? Well, it's important to remove the clutter. Um, and that that's, you got to find your own way to do that. For me, it was not to watch sports anymore, but I, I'm not going to tell somebody to don't do this because it worked for me. You know, yeah. uh, you know, find whatever it is that works for you. On N5D, if you go to the search bar, just type in open eye meditation. This is what it is, basically. You take two bottles, you know, any kind of bottles, glasses, jars, two of anything, put them about six feet in front of you and about six feet, six feet apart from each other. Try to focus on them, on both at the same time. You can't. What happens, though, is both sides of your brain cancel each other out and it goes blank. So... <clears throat> if you're looking for a quick way to make your mind go blank, try that. Wow. So when you meditate, I imagine it's different for all of us. Does your mind go blank? Is that the aim of your meditation? No. Sometimes it depends. It depends. <laughs> sometimes I want my mind to go blank and then I welcome in whatever thoughts come to me. And other times I just let it go blank and keep it there. Because I just don't want anything that that's, I just want to stay in that space of silence. Um, so it depends. It, um, there's so many ways of meditating, so many different forms of meditation. Um, I actually, um, I, I have a, a, another article 
on N5D that I wrote. Um, I think it's called, you know, do this right before you go to sleep at night. And it teaches you how to open your third eye like that so quickly uh, when you go to bed. Because a lot of times when you, right before you go to sleep, I'll, personally, I'll start to see like this bluish, purplish color. And then some images might come to me, like outlines of images. And then I fall asleep. But what's happening is your mind is going into that alpha state. And you can just hold that cognitively. Hold that when those images are just the outlines. Eventually, you'll, you'll be able to see the actual image itself. And uh, you'll get you'll get visions at that point. So you're so close. If you're seeing any of that, that that those like the outlines of images, the the purplish bluish colors, uh, while your eyes are shut, you're really close to having your third eye open. And it's so easy to do. It's so easy. What would you say were the main benefits that you got from meditating? Peace of mind. Yeah, just being able to relax, and uh, even though I'm a you know type B personality, I'm I'm pretty hyper for a type B. <laughs> I got a lot of energy, and you know I like doing things. I like being on the run, but it's nice to be able to slow down and get centered. And I'll tell you what, I'm a, I'm a triple Libra, which means my Sun, Moon, and Rising are all in Libra, and everyone thinks that Libras are all about balance. No. Uh, we're constantly seeking balance. So if you're a Libra, you understand what I'm saying. You're trying to find that balance. What do I need to do to attain this balance? And if you're a triple Libra, you're like, I'll do, I'll do anything. You'll go to extremes on either end trying to find that balance. And that's, yeah, that's probably why I was a little wild growing up. I love it. <laughs> what does that with your understanding and knowledge of the um, the metaphysical realm, does that balance, where does the masculine and feminine harmonies come into that? Let's start with the individual. Like because maybe men are hearing for the first time that they have some feminine energy in them. Can you talk to men about that? Definitely. Um, we all have divine masculine and divine feminine energies and I, any guy that denies it you're just lying to yourself you know when you were a kid you cried we all cried um, you might have saw a movie that made you cry like old yeller or something um, but unfortunately you know the way our culture is is like you know when you're a boy come on stop crying you know big boys don't cry take it like a man this kind of stuff you know, and, and we we kind of teach our children, our boys, our, our young boys, uh, to that that the divine the, the divine feminine is a weakness, and it's it's the wrong approach. It really is. Um, what happened with me is that, like I said, my daughter had a soul contract with me. She came in while well, she was. Um, conceived on my 33rd birthday so part of her plan was to get me going on my right track and how she did that was and it's funny too because my when people would ask me when my ex was pregnant would you like a, a boy or a girl are you hoping for a boy or a girl you know I think deep down you kind of hope one way or the other and I'd say yeah I'd like a son you know because I can play ball with him or whatever but it, I had a feeling it was going to be a daughter. I really just, deep down, I, I knew, I just knew she, it was going to be a daughter. And I wouldn't trade her for all the sons in the world now. You know, I, I'm so, I love my daughter so much. Um, but she, so she would do this. She's like three or four years old at the time. And she'd crawl up onto my lap at night in the evening, like on a Monday night or a Sunday night. Right before football was American football was to come on TV for the night game, and she'd curl up in a little ball on my lap and look at me with her little puppy dog eyes, and in her in her little angel voice she'd go, "Daddy, can I stay up and watch a little football with you?" I'd be like, "Sure, pumpkin." Yeah. Five minutes later, she's running around doing everything other than watching football. She had me wrapped around her pinky. <laughs> 
this went on for a couple of years before I re realized what she was doing. <laughs> but what she did, you know, it's that little soft voice, that little, you know, that kind of, it melted me. And having a child, I think also, it allows you to bring that inner child out once again, that's been hiding since you were a child yourself you know most people's most men's inner children has been hiding since they were probably 10 or 11 years old so you know we would make rain hats we jump in every mud puddle in the city and we just go out and do fun things she had her picture in the paper i don't know five six times she was on tv one time people are asking it was when she was with me and people are asking are, are you paying off the newspaper to get her in there? I'm like, no, we're just actually out doing fun things instead of staying in front of a TV. Yeah. But she's the one that broke down that whole macho side for me and showed me that side of myself I haven't seen in years. And I am so grateful that I had a daughter and her specifically. You know, once again, another soul contract. Amazing. So um, what's... What's your definition of masculinity in this day and age? I'll tell you what, you know, I was thinking about the whole toxic masculinity, what they call, you know, what a crock of sh I'm sorry, I can't say no, that. You but can swear, you can it? just be you. A crock of shit, Please. that is. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's a crock of shit. I'm, they're making it seem like everyone that's masculine is tox toxic, and that's bullshit. You know, we, yeah, I guess to extremes, you know, you, you know, it, it could be, but, you know, to, to take away the masculinity of us is the thing is, you know, what you have to do. And fortunately, yet another lesson I learned with my daughter is find that balance and understand and realize and accept that we're a combination of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And it's okay to have emotions. It doesn't make you any less of a man. I, th I think my wife digs me even more because I am that fully balanced and center centered man that we all need to be. As Interesting, men. isn't it? Because I think on the whole, the healing of the feminine has come in the last five years, but now it's really relevant that the men are rising heart and spine. And this toxic masculinity, a phrase that was probably coined by the media, is really mainstream at the moment. And I'm wondering if that's a direct attack on our men, you know, to, to try and hold them down. Because once our men rise, we're, we're cool, we're good, you know. I mean, obviously we need the women as well, but it's the men and the qualities of the divine masculine that, you know, we um, are really coming into the, the healing journey of the men at the moment. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, when, also when you throw in like, you know, having to declare these pronouns and then, yeah, I'm 100% man, I'm him, he or whatever, I, you know, it should be kind of obvious, but I, I think this is all part of the, the melding of, I guess they're trying to get everybody to be like one sex, basically, you know, and that's not the way it is. They're, they're, you have the male, you have the female, you have to have them to be, you know, one ultimate as, as like as a twin flame, like Allie and me. You know, she's my uh, divine feminine half of myself, and uh, you know, it's 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 this perfect union together that are is just has this symbiotic relationship with one another that makes it so strong. You know, I've had this idea, Greg, that um, because so. Um many of us are coming into our um, healthier masculine and feminine aspects and healing. It's really just a healing journey to come into love and find our peace. But what I'm thinking with this, um, let's say uh, it's the inverse that they're trying to create a, a masculine, feminine and, and drop and drop, what's the word? Um, you know, when, you know, when you, and, and, Oh God, when you can't tell if it's masculine or feminine, it's all combined, right? I'm a writer. I, I don't speak as well. I usually let the men do the talking. But that's maybe the inverse of the divine aspect of, of 
um, you know, healed men and women coming together to create divine union because that is so forceful. Does, does any of that resonate? I, I remember as a kid, um, David Bowie, he was just, you know, talk about androgynous. That's the yeah, word. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But his lyrics were just so futuristic as well, though. Mm -hmm. And there was something intriguing about him. But yet, it was an act. It wasn't, it, I don't know. Yeah. It anyway, was just, was a, just a, a thought that, reality. you know. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. How, how is Ali, by the way? Uh, she was busy yesterday. She taught a class and then she did her uh, weekly tarot forecast last night. Uh, she does that every week on the in 5 YouTube channel. So, and she's so accurate at that. I mean, so many people compliment her on just her brief uh, uh, weekly tarot forecast. I say, wait till you get a reading with her, you know, oh, where she can tune into your energy. Yeah, yeah, she's just a beautiful soul. Um, what would you say would be the, because you guys how long is it that you've been married now a year in november and you're still living she's still in the uk and you're in the states is that right florida yeah i'll be going there to the uk um in about three weeks for a month yeah exciting so what are the challenges that have come up with what you and i'll just you know what you are referring to as a twin flame relationship Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, distance is a challenge, but we try to FaceTime every day. We probably FaceTime more than people who actually live together. We probably are with each other yeah. more than with people who actually live together. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, that's probably our major challenge. Uh, outside of that, we, we, we never argue. She's just like she's t type B, laid back, easygoing, and... Uh, we just get along so well in every way imaginable. So uh, I, I'm, I'm head over heels crazy about her. I brag about her. I scream her name off of every available rooftop. I need to I need to make it to Australia because there's some rooftops there I haven't screamed off of, of how much I love her. Yeah, she's oh, amazing. That's so beautiful. I'm so happy for the both of you. And when you come to Australia, make sure you look me up. Right. <laughs> uh, Greg, let's go back to um, fatherhood. Were there yeah. any particularly challenging moments there that we can explore? Because a lot of men do this um, shared custody gig. So what were, um, the, what were the challenges there? Well, just making sure that everything you do is in the best best interest of your child because like i said i i i don't believe in spanking and hitting but how do you tell that to your spouse that does right you know that's a challenge yeah that could be a challenge um, how do you deal with that how do you process that you just have to stand your ground say i don't believe in this it's not right it's not the right thing to do but in the end as long as you're at least here in the states as long as you're not forceful forcefully hitting them hard enough to leave a mark they won't do anything about it is there a so, certain point with with um certain issues you just have to let go and surrender let go of control I think we find that in many areas of life, there's a lot of things that aren't worth arguing over. I, I, I you know, for me, in this genre, uh, Nasara is one that I won't. I've written about Nasara and people. It's been going on since the 1970s, and they keep promising it. It hasn't came around, but people are adamant. Oh, it's coming now. Oh, I. Okay, yeah. Well, I heard that for 40 years <laughs> you know it's not happening yet uh, another one is you know religion and jesus i i let people believe what they want to believe and you know that's 
some things aren't worth arguing over and stirring the pot over, you know? So you just let it go and let it go. And, you know, who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe, yeah, I could have all the proof in the world, but, you know, it, it's like when people got the jab, you know, they, they got it despite hearing about all this other stuff, negative stuff, and um, they still went and got it. And now they'll stand behind their beliefs on why they got it, even though more and more information is coming out that they probably shouldn't have. Where does the ego come into this? It's a good question. That I don't know. Honestly, I, I have no answer. Okay. What would you say? <laughs> well, I think there's um, a healthy ego, which um, gives us drive and survival. And um, if we learn to navigate it properly uh, to our highest good, we are pushed in the direction we need to go. And there's negative ego, which is self-serving um, and doesn't push us to our highest place. I think it's really about analyzing our own ego and coming to understand it. When we use it, what are we using it for? Being aware of it. It seems like a lot of people, a lot of us in, in this genre, we, I think we've dealt with the ego for so long that, you know, it's, it's like an afterthought at this point, you know, because you just want to do what's best for the greater good. And that has nothing to do with ego. And when you get to that point, you, you don't even think about it. It's just serving others. Exactly. You know, bringing star family together. That's what I, I want to do. It has nothing to do with ego. Yeah, let's talk about that. Did this shift from service to self to service to others, are you aware of when that happened in you? And was that to do with you discovering your mission? <laughs> I think you're kind of born one way or the other. Honestly, you're either a giver or a taker. And I guess you could learn to be one or the other. But I think for the most part, people in this genre are pretty much givers. You know, I, I've got on my website, I've got thousands of articles, all of them free, hundreds of videos on the N5D YouTube channel, all of them free. You know, we just give and give and give. Yeah. That's what we do. And I'll put all those links in, in the description below so you've got access to all of Greg's amazing yeah. work. Um, so thank you for that, firstly, um, that, you know, you've given so much to humanity and um, I really need to get back in and, and explore it too because I was there a while ago, but I'm sure you put out a whole heap of new stuff. So <laughs> I will get back in there. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your highest value as a man today? Greg? Highest value as a man? So, well, obviously, I, I would say, you know, loving others, you know, that's, yeah. it's all about love, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And what exactly. would be, a, what would yeah. be a sub value? What would be another value outside of love? Oh, well, I, yeah. I mean, some men, you know, when I've asked that question before, they might say integrity or truth or, you know, I mean, anywhere, yeah. you know, along those lines, I guess, you know, love encompasses it all in a, in a, in a broader spectrum. But um, yeah. those are like sub values of love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Honor, you know, benevolence or, you know, um, yeah. ideas yeah. that have come yeah. up because you know what would you, I mean let's say looking at the the divine masculine aspects so love is obviously one of them can you expand on any others that you know you really felt grounded into as you've um, walked further along your healing path empathy empathy okay yeah Empathic. what does that what does that feel like it's being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes or at least have having been there and you know, understanding where they're 
where they're coming from. Um, and for example, you know, oftentimes, you know, and when you're comparing the male and the female, like a male can't empathize having a child. They can't be empathic. Happy. They can sympathize. They can't empathize. You know, I, I've never had a child. Never will. Yeah. Personally. I have a child, but I've, I've never had a child. Yeah, never um, given birth. So, yeah, yeah. And I was there for my daughter's birth, but, you know, I, yeah, and being empathic, though. And I think there's a lot of times you, you can just sense energies as well, you know, um, the presence of energies, whether it's invisible energies or, you know, if somebody's putting off a bad energy that, is nearby you can pick that up um, as an empath much more easier i would say than someone who's not an empath what does what does presence mean to you <laughs> well I'm curious what it means to you <laughs> i know what it means i'll i'll, I'll answer it first I, I'm, but i'm curious what you have to say it's being in the now it's being in the moment right now you know it's being able to not be too far ahead or not to live too far behind but being right here right now in the center being present being aware without judging without yeah. you know just just being basically what, what, yeah i'm curious I, yeah i totally agree with that and i would say the same but i did have a, a reason for this so a lot of us and let's talk about men are stuck on something in the past or they're worried about something in the future. And this was my aim to get this um, topic of presence discussed. So what would you say to men that can't let or are having a challenge letting go of something in the past? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, obviously, you know, my, my background is in psychology. I was a child and family therapist for at-risk youth. And I, I don't want to look at it too much from a psychological perspective. I'd rather look at it more metaphysically. But yet, there, you know, psych psychologically, there's something, there's something that's been eating at this person for a long time. There's a root to the issue that has to be addressed at some point, at some level. Um, and it doesn't have to be through a psychologist, definitely not through a psychiatrist, because the only thing they're going to do is give you medications. But uh, I think, you know, it's a lot of inner work in unpeeling the layers of the onion to get to that ultimate point of understanding why is this happening. And then from taking that point, moving forward in a beneficial way. Okay, this um, this concept of inner work, we all talk about it, we've all been doing it for years, but for someone who's maybe new to this, like, well, people keep talking about this inner work. Can someone tell me exactly what it is? You're the <laughs> man. <laughs> life, life will present to you exactly what you need to know. Oh, open your eyes, pay attention. It'll tell you, okay, if something is irritating me here, why is it irritating? And that's just asking yourself, being like you were saying, we're talking about being in the present. Why is this irritating me now? What were the triggers that brought this on me? And how do I address this from this point forward? Um, and you keep giving all these things that you need to, that we all have to work on, you know, throughout our spiritual journey. And we're all still working on things, you know, no one's fully done with their work. Like I said, if you were, you'd, you would have ascended by now, you know, so we all have we all have work to do. But the more you attack these issues and unravel and unpeel that onion, so to speak, you know, and get to the, the root of everything that needs to be addressed. Once again, if you take that analogy of going to a buffet, filling your plate and fork full by fork full, in this case, you're portful by portful, getting rid of each thing that you need to address, eventually your plate's going to empty. But unfortunately, I hate to tell you, there's more things that are going on your plate with, when your back's turned. Yeah, that plate will never be empty. <laughs> but do you, would you agree it gets easier? 
once Definitely. we learn to navigate our triggers and we 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 can you know we've got a pretty good idea of of uh of our inner workings yeah definitely uh there's when you have less on your plate you know it's, it's a lighter feeling you know it's your vibration rises the, the less you have in your plate the more your vibration rises so let's now uh, go into the future. What about men who are worried about the future and often often as protectors and providers, especially in you know the chaotic uh, scene of many places in the in the world today, what can you say to those men? I'm not sure what you're asking but about the future, how what they're oh, worried about yeah, how to stop worrying about the future. In what ways would they be worrying about it? Well, they might be worrying financially or they might be worried that, you know, um, um, there might be violence in the streets or just that uncertainty. Well, I can understand. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, oftentimes, you know, statistics have proven that most of the things we worry about are all in our head. <laughs> we we make up so much stuff that we worry about and you know, or what we think other people are thinking when they're not actually thinking that. You're the only one that's thinking that. I'm the only one that's thinking that, you know. Um, so much of this stuff is in our head. Just get out of your head. You know, If you start doing that, I would recommend that uh, open eye meditation, learn how to clear your mind, you yeah. know, with those two bottles. Just get back to right now. What's important? What's happening? What's what's important right now here today? Just Don't worry easy. about that. Does music help put you in the now, in the present? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, obviously men who are into music, that can help. Um, anything else that can bring them back into the present apart from meditation and music? Well, it's fun. Well, I want to touch on music real quick, though. Yeah, um, yeah, go for it. As a... Um, as a guitarist, you know, I, I, I would play in, you know, these hard rock bands. And, you know, people who say, oh, well, that's like, you know, all this negative music and stuff like that. Yeah, one of my favorite songs was by Van Halen, Ain't Talking About Love. And that's the antithesis of what we practice. And, but it just has such a great, bah, 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 bah. has a great vibe to, to the music, the flow, the lyrics, everything. Everything rocks in that song. The lyrics, man, yeah, I could. I could care less, you know, because it's it's just it's just a song. It's what it's how it makes you feel. The yes. bottom line: if you feel good listening to any song, how can that be a bad thing? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when yesterday. Anyone, yeah. yeah, yeah when anyone says, you know, how, well, how do you raise your vibration? Well, what makes you feel good? You know, and. Yes you know, laughing, going out in nature, swimming in the ocean. Maybe it's uh, going for a run, um, listening to your favorite music. Anything that makes you feel good that isn't hurting someone else raises your vibration. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday I learned uh, a song by the monkeys. You know, anyone that knows me, you know, they, they'd probably think, oh, what's the latest song you learned or the latest band you're you know, listening to? I'd be like, you know. I don't know, Guns N' Roses or something. Yeah. If they heard me playing a monkey song, they'd probably shit their pants. But yeah, I learned a song by the monkeys yesterday. I, do you even know who the monkeys are? Yeah, I do. I can't think of any that they saw. Is it the, hey, 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 we're yes. the monkeys? <laughs> yes, yes. They have a song called Stepping Stone. And I, I learned that on guitar yesterday. and It was just fun to learn and what I ended up doing was I I I, I got a uh, it's a backing track so they take out all the vocals in there, and so I get to sing along with it, play guitar to it, and uh, what I ended up doing was I took it into a mixer and edited it in a spot where I could put a long lead in there, and uh, it, it I just had a lot of fun with it. So anyway, um, it's how it, music is how how it makes you feel. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whatever you're listening to, as long as it makes you feel good, keep listening to it. Whatever yeah, it is. That's right. Dancing, laughing, even sex, you know, because it brings us into the moment and we're not worrying about paying bills and we're not worried about, you know, what our ex is doing or, you know, though that aspect of the past and, and holding on to the past and worrying about the future. So all those things, um, anything that makes us feel 
anything that brings us into our senses, you know, like if we're watching, for example, a dog play, you know, for that moment, our senses are bringing us right into the present. You know, if we're feeling the wind uh, in our hair or we're, you know, listening to music or, you know, tasting a delicious chocolate cake, you know, all our senses bring us back into the present, right? Yeah, I think babies and puppies can do that real quick. Yeah, exactly. It's just the trick is to stay in that moment, right? Because as soon as that external stimulus is taken away, then we start creating the stories again. But, you know, if we, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a yo-yo, isn't it? You know, being aware of your mind, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And then, you know, our whole life becomes a state of walking meditation. True. That is true. Greg, where does the heart come into all of this? From a, a man's perspective. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, it forms, everything forms from the heart and comes out. Mm. The heart's been there the whole time. It, it, everything forms from the heart. Extent. That's why we have all these huge neural networks going on. And they say that the heart is more powerful than the brain in uh, uh, electromagnetic sense. So yeah, uh, unfortunately though, for a lot of guys, you know, we, we tend to hide the heart behind, you know, this macho facade. And uh, it's really doing your, your, yourself a disservice because you're denying part of yourself, not only to yourself, but to everybody that you encounter. Um, so, and to a potential mate as well. So, you know, just once again, be true to yourself, you know, it's okay to, it's okay to have, to have a balance of male and female, mas divine masculine and divine feminine, you know, without, you know, without losing who you are, you know, like tonight they're here in the, uh, well, it's 8, 10 PM right now. There's a football game, American football game on tonight like half an hour of that I'll probably be watching and, you know, throwing stuff at the TV. Ah, oh, yeah. Bomb. You know, so, but just being a guy doing, doing, doing guy thing. And I, you know, it doesn't take, that doesn't mean that, you know, I've lost that divine feminine side of myself because, you know, cause, you know I, I, I can still tune into that anytime. Thank you to my daughter who showed me that side of myself and I, I refuse to let go. So yeah, just once again, to the guys out there, you know, that are watching, um, just be true to yourself, you know. Uh, it's worth repeating one more time. You know, too many people will live their entire lives pretending to be what society expects them to be and will go to their graves never knowing who they truly were. Don't be that person. Exactly. Find your authenticity. That's such a key to freedom, isn't it? And that's the masculine drive, if, if you agree, freedom. Um, and that is being ourselves. So it's a vital part that, you know, you're reinforcing there. Um, Greg, throughout your um, previous marriages and your any other relationships, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned in relating to women? I got to admit, I was probably pretty stubborn on this one, thinking that, you know, well, I haven't changed. Yeah, we're all changing. We're changing every day, you know, and um, to be stuck in that mindset of, you know, well, you know it, perhaps I, I could have done more in a different relationship. You know, maybe I didn't give as much as I could have or should have or as much as they deserved, you know, because of you know, typical male role models and responses and how we act and how we think other people are perceiving us. And, you know, you get caught up in all that minutia and it's not worth it, you know. There's so much more to life than just worrying about crap. And, you know, for me, it's just about being my authentic, true self. And I can, this is who I am with you, uh, with people that meet me at, like, for example, here in I have a I have a N five D weekly or a monthly beach meetup where we get together. If you're meeting me for the first time on the beach, this, what you're seeing right now is what you get. Yeah. Ellie, 
will attest to my beautiful wife, you know, this, this is the man that I am at all times. So, you know, it's just being true to yourself, um, not worrying about what society thinks you are and what you should be. It's so true. Yeah. Um, Greg, what would you say to men? Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you feel is really important? So we're going to start wrapping up now. Um, and I'm giving you the platform to talk to men, anything that you'd like to say. That was pretty much, uh, if I could say anything, it'd be just be true to yourself. Yeah, uh, don't, and and your your lady friends will love you even that much more when they see that you're able to balance that divine that masculine with the divine feminine and still be who you are, you still be, you know, one of the guys, one of the dudes, yeah. and without losing who you really are. Just be who you really are. That's, that's the most yeah. important thing. Yeah, how does a man know when he's aligned with his true self? You're not faking anything. Everything is true. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because for someone that's maybe been doing it for as you know as long as they can remember, you know, they, well, what is the real me? How do you how do you find that out? Well, I, I, once again, I, I think, you know, if you're not being true to yourself then you're not being the real you. If you're pretending to be somebody else, then you're not you. You're some you are somebody else. You're pretending to be somebody else. Just find find out who you are. Yeah. So you're lying basically to yourself and to everyone else. And you know, you can't I don't believe if you're if you uh if that is your embodiment, you're never going to align with love. You're only going to attract people who are also in that state of dishonesty. So, you know, you have to find yourself to then open up to other honest people and, and really find true love. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Um, Greg, uh, I'm going to put all your links that you send me below. But if you'd like to talk about where people can find you, what you do within 5D, your podcast, your writing, please, please take uh, the time you need. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, check it out at in5d.com. Actually, I have a new banner um, that's arriving. It's it's much more cosmic than what I have right here. The logo just changed. So if you go to in5d.com, you'll see the new logo. I gave it a whole new appearance on In5D. It looks great. Um, so yeah, check that out, in5d.com. Um, I also have a, like, this is a, I have these quantum tie-dye t-shirts. Um, and what I do is I put for example, um, gemstones in each one of the chakra colors. And then I put a little of this uh, Siesta Key 99.9% quartz crystal sand in, into the dye. So the shirts have that energy of both the gemstones and the quartz crystal. Quartz crystal actually supercharges the gemstones. And then that, that's all locked into the shirts. People say well, that when they wear these shirts, they have amazing dreams at night. So. Yeah, and then when I send them out, I sprinkle even more uh, quartz crystal sand on the shirts. I have people that are collecting the sand in like little vials and stuff. But what it's doing too is it it's bringing together points of light all around the world. I've sent these shirts all around the world, and that sand is going. That Atlantis sand is going everywhere. It's connecting all these points of light together. So um, it's really exciting, and you know, I I really it's one of my passions is is, is making these these shirts and seeing how I love, it. I love that out. one it's uh yeah just beautiful colors and design and they'd, they'd all be so unique as well I love yeah, that definitely. um actually it is it is called be beautiful so yeah yeah that's the name of this shirt be beautiful b-e-e-y-o-u tipple yeah very good so yeah that's pretty much it Greg have you got your oh, guitar class? well also I'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry, one last thing, uh, the N5D YouTube channel. And um, be sure to check out uh, my wife and me on Tuesday nights. We do a global prediction at 6 p.m. Eastern. So that would be uh, uh, 8 a.m. Australian time. Wake up, have your breakfast to Allie and me. We do these global predictions. And then at two hours later, we do, uh, a, it's called date night. But for you guys, I guess it would be date morning. But it's not it's not a 
what we do, we talk about anything and everything. It's not just for single people. If you are single, we put you on this list and we have these banners that go across the bottom to, you know, for everybody to put that intention that they find their true person that they're supposed to be with their soulmate, twin flame, whatever you might want to call it. Yeah. So we do that as well. Um, I also have on N5D um, on, on Facebook, it's called N5D Love Connection, where we encourage people to join there and just who knows who you might find there. So uh, we're trying to bring together um, people of uh, uh, like mindedness and soulmates and who knows. You know. Like a, a, a dating group to, to connect yeah. singles. Yes, yes, yes. And trust me, well, I, I didn't tell you this story too. Um, Allie came to me in my dream after I watched The Secret. And uh, she didn't say anything. This is like in 2007, 2008. She didn't say anything. She's smiling at me. And I'll remember it was her from her neck up. So I had a beach meetup with Tabadina from Sology um, in 2020, January of 2020. And uh, before I, I went to the meetup, I went through Todd's Facebook page to make sure that I had friended anyone that had sent me a friend request. And I'm going through his friends. And there's the face I saw in my dream from. 13 years ago, it was her, it was Allie. So now <laughs> Allie had visited me in my dreams 13 years before that. Here, I see she's here incarnated. At the time I thought she was on the other side of the veil because I saw her in my dreams, but she was here. And uh, so I had I, I ended up sending her a friend request and now it's my turn, I have to stalk her. <laughs> she stalked me in my dreams. <laughs> but how do you tell somebody that you've never met? You know, you're my twin flame, I know it, you know? And But anyway, I made it. I made a reading with her. I had a reading, uh, a tarot reading with her, and we just hit it off. And and after a while, I told her, I believe in you. And then when I told her that, that's when everything opened up for her. It just flooded because I've been telling her that in every lifetime, I believe in you. And, uh, you know, it just flooded. And she re she remembered pre previous lives that we've had together at that point. So um, the point of all this is it. Physical geographical location doesn't matter. I'm in Florida. She's in the UK. Your your other half, that soulmate, is out there waiting for you. And don't let your physical location deter you from finding that person. So we have that Tuesday night, date night. So you know, if you want your name added to that list, let me know, and I'll put it on that list. Oh, I love it. And I've actually been friends with Alison a lot longer than I have with you, even though I, I've been following you. So, you know, I'm well aware of your journey of your marriage and all that. You know, I was I was yeah. following all that on Facebook. So that's such wow. a beautiful story. And yeah. I'll be joining your singles Facebook group, too. Awesome. So maybe my awesome. man's in there. <laughs> OK, well, I'll make sure that I add your name to the list and it'll, it'll be on there tomorrow night. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Right. Um, how do you feel about giving it? Have you got your guitar close by? Do we get a little, no. um, a little, oh, God, it's, it would sound, the, the latency sounds, yeah, the latency sounds horrible. Um, my guitar is in the, the other room over there. So, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe another time. If you have me back out, ask, I'll, right? I'll, I'll play guitar. Because you right? do drumming too, right? On the beach. Is that right? Yeah. Little, All right. Oh, give us a, can you give us a drum roll out? Mm, all right. <laughs> Just quick. Thank so. you. I know I put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sorry, I didn't sing along with it. Yeah, it's um, it's been absolute pleasure, Greg. And thank you. We've That's gone, awesome. you know, new places into the metaphysical realm, and I love all this. And you know, every man is so unique and bringing in such beautiful, unique wisdom and awareness and insights. So, thank you so very much. All my love to Ali and uh, and both of you. Many blessings on your union. And um, as I said, if you're ever in Australia, please look me up. Will do. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. I'm going to stop the recording now, but you can hang on. Bye, everyone. I'll be back um, in, a, in a couple of days with another episode of Heart Warriors.